David. Thank you. Uh, that was awesome. Getting an int- introduction like that. I've never had that. That was like the first three minutes I was going to do. So, well, it's out of the way. Um, yeah, I'm David. I work at a company called Segment in San Francisco doing application security, cloud security, securing all the things. Um, but I'm here today to talk about usable security. Because creating usable software can be a difficult thing to do. Um, specifically with security tools, the user experience is often overlooked. And I believe that by creating more usable security tools, we won't just create a more pleasant user experience, but we can ultimately improve the security of our organizations. So I'm going to talk about why I think UX can lead to better security and how we address this problem of usable security um, with the Zap project. So what do I mean by usable? Well, there's three things that I like to highlight about that. Usable software should be accessible, intuitive, and flexible. So by that, I mean with accessible, that anyone who hasn't even used your software before should be able to have a sense of how to get started with it immediately. It should be a low barrier to entry. By intuitive, it should be easy to figure out what the next thing to do is. It should be included in a native environment to your users' workflows. And with flexible, we want to make sure that we don't assume what our users' workflows look like. We want to make sure our tool is flexible enough, you can bend it to whatever they need to use the tool for. And these principles might seem like good things for any software, but you can imagine a tool that's really effective at doing a job and still isn't any one of these things. You can imagine some software where the developers of it are prioritizing new features and optimizations before addressing uh, usability and accessibility. And usable software leads to more effective organizations, right? I mean, I'm talking outside of even the realm of just security. When employees at your company are using uh, usable software, they're going to be uh, more effective, they're going to be quicker at their jobs, they're going to enjoy doing their jobs a little more. But by that same token, usable security software leads to a more secure organization. I think it does this in two ways. The first is it's going to make your security team more effective. They're going to be better at their job, and they're going to deal with it more enjoyably. But secondly, by focusing on usability, we can enable our developers in QA to use these tools. And that's the part I want to focus on. Enabling developers to use security tools will improve the security of your organization. I think security teams often can silo themselves in and try to take on the full responsibility of security. But we know security is everybody's responsibility, right? And there's a push left in the industry, right? There's things like CI, CD, um, integrating security in there, uh, DevSecOps. All these are kind of buzzwordy terms. Um, I think they do still reflect this like fundamental truth that by integrating security in your entire organization, you're going to be much better off. Because if we can empower developers to use security in their workflows, we can ask them hard questions like, Hey, is this new feature of yours vulnerable uh, to XSS? I think it's a hard question to ask developers. A lot of times they won't know what to do. How can they test that? What tools should they use? What are they looking for? And what about more complicated questions, right? Permissions bypass, SSRF. And so what can we do to address this? What can we do to enable them to be able to handle these sort of problems? Now I want to talk about what we did um, with this dead attack proxy, Zap. So if you're unfamiliar with Zap, it's an attack proxy used to pen test your web application. If you use Burp Suite, it's basically the same thing, uh, except it's free, open source, and supported by a smaller team. And the way it works is that you'll have your browser open with a web application you want to test, and that when you, your browser sends a request, it's actually going to get intercepted by Zap, which will forward it onto the server, and when the server responds, that message then gets, again, intercepted by Zap and forwarded onto your browser. And by having this man-in-the-middle position, uh, we can do a lot of powerful things. When you're using Zap, you usually have it set up something like this. You have the application window open on one side, your browser. You kind of go in between the two uh, using tools on one side, uh, looking how it re- reflects in the browser on the other. 
And this is just a short list of all the things you can do with Zap, right? You can intercept messages. You can replay them. Um, you can crawl your site to find all the different routes and different pages. You can fuzz requests. You can do passive active scanning. There's this robust add-on um, community. You can add scripts that change the way Zap works. It's extremely powerful. But Zap isn't the most trivial tool to start using. I mean, today or yesterday, I gave training to security professionals on how to use it because it's, it's not that simple to start, right? You have to go take a training to learn how to use it properly. Like, this is a problem. How can we expect developers to want to use this tool if we can't even use it ourselves? So we decided to take some inspiration from heads-up displays and how we can improve this. So here's a heads-up display uh, for a fighter pilot. Heads-up display is a transparent display that overlays information right in your natural viewport. So some of the things we have on here, right? We have altitude, um, we have your speed, acceleration. We have something called the boresight on here, which is the direction your nose is pointing. There's a number on here called the flight path vector, which is the direction the plane is actually moving. You have information about your attack systems. You have an attack reticle on there. All this information is so effectively displayed in one simple screen. And now imagine that if instead of having this heads-up display, we had a bunch of gauges and knobs along this huge dashboard. As you're trying to fly the plane, you have to look down just to check your speed or what the system is or anything like that. It would be impossible to fly. Another example of heads-up displays is in video games. Here we have things like uh, our ammo count, what's our weapon status. We have a mini-map which is showing our, uh, uh, where our goals are. We even have dynamic overlays over other players giving friend or foe status. And again, imagine if to view this information, you had to go to a pause screen. You had to stop playing the game, pause, and oh, how much ammo do I have? Okay, go back. Oh, where am I? Okay, go to my pause screen. Okay, go back. It would be impossible. You'd be healed immediately, right? You can't use the tool like that. And that's what it's like using Zap, constantly leaving the natural context, leaving your browser, and going back to another tool. It's extremely ineffective. So we took these same elements that make a heads-up display effective, and we created the Zap heads-up display. So with that, I have a video demo, but that's only in case the live demo fails. So let's see if we can get this. Um, So here we have Zap. Oh, that's not great resolution. Well, uh, here we have Zap, and here we have G-Shop uh, running with our heads-up display. So it's a little hard to see, but this is normal G-Shop, and we've added these elements on the right and left. And these are providing access to the same features that are in Zap right in the browser. So, for example, uh, we've got these different tools that encapsulate these different features. And so we have our site tree tool, which will allow us to explore the site just like we could in Zap and see all the different parts that make it up. We can also um, view the different alerts that Zap has found from passive or active scanning. So if we want to see some alerts that happened exactly on this specific page, we can view that information right here. And if we wanted to view alerts from across the entire site, the entire domain, we could view those here and the different pages that they were found on. We also have this scope tool up here, which allows us to tell Zap what things we want to attack, what's in scope for this attack. And by simply pressing uh, the button and saying add, we've just told Zap that now this is the domain we want to attack. And by the same token, if we want to start a spider to crawl our entire site, Simply press the button, hit start, and you can see the spider has taken off. And if you view in Zap, you can see it's actually blasting it right now. And we can stop running that. So we've made it much more intuitive to access these features of Zap right in the browser. And there is a little bit of a trade-off by doing this, though, right? We've limited the ability maybe the power of our tools by forcing them into these um, consistent uh, UI elements, right? Everything is displayed in these different tools. So maybe you don't have the same uh, power that we can display these things in the traditional Zap, but look at the gain, right? This is so much more accessible. Anyone who opens this up is going to immediately understand how and where to find the different features. 
And you can even customize it. So say we're not interested in these information alerts that pop up. Well, we can just remove them from our heads-up display. And let's say we wanted to add another tool. We can just add another tool uh, to our heads-up display just like that. So there's some other cool features we can do with this, right? One of the most common things you want to do in testing is intercept messages. So we can use the break tool, which allows us to intercept. So if we turn that on, on we're now going to be able to intercept uh, messages. If we try to add something to our cart, it's going to display it right in the browser, the message we just sent. And of course, we can step through that. That allowed the request to come through, and now the response is received by the browser. And if we step through that one more time, we'll see an interesting uh, message come through, trying to add something to our cart. Of course, like any good hacker, we should change that one to a negative 100. If we press continue, we now turn off intercept and allow all the messages to go through. And if we were to view our cart, uh, or view our basket, we'll now see that we've just purchased something for negative $200. We can also replay messages with it. You'll see this bottom drawer, which I haven't discussed yet. This is just like your dev tools uh, in Chrome or Firefox. And here we can see the history of all the different uh, messages that we've sent. So if I were to go to here and search for apples, you can see that comes right in the bottom. And by clicking on it, we can view the request and response we just sent. And we can replay it right here. And it'll give us a response back. And you'll notice that the response uh, now contains what we've just altered the message to be. There's a couple other f neat features we have on here as well. Let's actually go to the OWASP uh, login page. You'll notice that we have these growler alerts that pop up on the right side. Those are notifying us every time Zap has detected a new type of alert on your, this new domain that we've just visited. You'll also see this little tool right here. It's got a number six by it. Zap has scanned the page that we're on and has detected that there are six hidden or disabled fields. And by pressing that, we'll now reveal those. So these, these fields before, these hidden inputs, we can modify the application that we're trying to test and view that right there. That's a little bit of a silly feature, right? Of course, we could have looked in the source and found these things, but think about how much more easy we've just made this. And think about what else we can do with this kind of power. What else can we do by modifying the page that we're trying to test? Let's go to another uh, test application. We'll go to budget. And let's check out the attack tool. So the attack tool will automatically, uh, actively scan, it'll throw a bundle, so SQLi, XSS, all these different attacks right at the pages that you're browsing. So if we add budget to our scope, and we turn on this attack tool, immediately Zap is gonna start hammering it. And you can see in the right, uh, the active scanner, if I pull this open, <laughs> is going to start attacking it. Um, and if we're lucky, let's see. Oh, we can see it's starting to find issues by visiting it. Um, let me turn this off again. As we start visiting pages, uh, and we search for things, you can see it just found cross-site scripting on that page, right? by using the attack mode. What's even cooler though is if we go back to that search page, we can see that it's marked the form that it found XSS in. That is the coolest thing in the world. Like this is the whole goal of my working on it. That's so awesome. <laughs> like this is like the reason why I wanted to work on this project is how can we take this mentality, how do we take this information that security people have and just jam that right into the browser so that anyone can kind of see through the way we see things. And if you were to click on the icon, it'll actually tell you the alert and what the problem was right there. Nice. That worked. That was really cool. <laughs> um, and so 
So we have all these neat features. This is really cool. This is really powerful. But it's not enough, right? We don't want to limit what we can do with the heads of display, but only what, what we've thought of, right? We want this tool to be flexible for our users. And so we've made it as easy as possible to customize uh, all the different aspects of it. You saw we can um, rearrange the heads of display however we like. In the future, right, our vision is it to be a drag and drop interface, almost like rearranging um, the home screen on your phone. And say perhaps these things are getting in the way, you can hide the heads up display so that it doesn't interfere with their normal browsing. But even more than that, we've made it really easy to extend the heads up display. And so I'm going to show you how we can create a new tool in less than just a few minutes I'm using just Zap. So if I open up Zap, and bring this down. We have this scripts feature. And the scripting allows us to change the behaviors of Zap um, in the different, uh, when it receives a message, when it attacks something. We can modify all these little things. And you can see we have this uh, script down here called Hackett. And this is a Zest script, which is this abandoned Mozilla visual scripting language. But all you really need to know is that what this script does is uh, whenever it sees the word budget in a page, it's going to replace it with the word hacked it. And by enabling that, any message we proxy, it'll automatically modify it. You also see in this scripting console, we now have this heads up display option. And these are all the files that make up the heads up display. So you can modify them right here. And so we're going to take this attack tool, we're going to duplicate it. And we're going to now call this hack it. We can see the code over here. <laughs> Edge detection is hard. All right, well, I guess I'll just go on this little pane right here. Here's all the code that builds up this tool. So there's only a few things we actually need to change uh, to make it work. So we're going to change the name of our tool. We're going to change uh, what it displays on the label here. And we're going to change what the dialog is. It seems like it's backwards. It's not. Don't worry. Turn on Hackett. And there's only two other things we need to change to make our tool work for us. So the first thing we're going to change is what happens when we try to turn it on. And so I'm going to change this. Change this. And change what parameters we're setting it. I think it's good name. And then we're going to modify what happens when we turn it off. And we'll just change this right here. And with that, we press save. And we've just created a new tool. So to see that, we close this browser. And let me relaunch uh, the browser. We can use our cool browser launch feature. And this is going to boot up Firefox. We have the heads up display running. And when I go to Juice Shop, oh, right. Uh, we'll have our heads up display load around us. And you'll see that we now have, when we go to add a new tool, there's our new tool. Because of display issues, let me go to this. And when we turn it on, hack it's running. And so if we go to the budget page, uh, rip. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully. didn't work. 
Did I? I'm going to open source this presentation right here. What I mess up, guys? At the top? Oh, uh, yeah, no, th those parts are okay. Because this part, right? You're saying that's backwards? And the Zest script? Uh, all right, well, I probably just misnamed one of the things here. Actually, I have it right here. Oh, rip. There we go. File extensions are hard. All right. Got to make this demo work. Let's save that. And let's go back to, let's get rid of that. And let's launch our browser again. And let's go to budget. We'll add our tool. Where'd it go? There we go. We'll add our tool. And we'll turn it on. And we'll refresh the page. There it is. Yay. <laughs> Well, you can imagine had that gone flawlessly, how impactful that would have been. But, I mean, just imagine what we just did here. Like, yes, we're using a Zest script, and yes, we're only changing one little thing, but we've taken a script that we can incorporate anywhere into Zap, or that does anything else we want. You can write it in JavaScript, Python, Ruby, and we've put it right up into the heads-up display in a live demo. Like, that's how easy it should be to cr make this do what you want it to do. All right. That is the end of our live demo. Let's go back to the slides. So, that was all pretty neat, but how does it all actually uh, work? So, you might be thinking, okay, cool, you built a browser extension, um, it does some things, that's neat. But we didn't build this at all with any browser extensions. You might be thinking, there's no way you did that. Why would you do that? Well, the goal, right, is that we don't one, we don't want to create more work for ourselves. If we have to support browser extensions, we have to support multiple code bases. But additionally, we'll probably still won't get all the code bases. And we want to make sure that anyone, uh, who's, anyone who's using any sort of browser can use this tool. And so the way this works is that we have our normal uh, Zap workflow here, right? We have responses, requests getting intercepted, responses getting intercepted. But when we use the heads up display, we're actually going to tweak the response just a little bit we're going to add this single pair of script tags in here. This is going to reference a JavaScript file that's served back from Zap and adds iframes to the DOM of our target page. So if you were to view the source of that, you'd see here's the script that we've just injected into the target page. And this is going to add those iframes. We also want to make sure that the HUD had a low footprint, right? We don't want to start modifying our the page we're attacking and break it or skew results if we have some sort of client-side scanning. And so we used uh, a JavaScript closure to make sure that the code rewriting is separated and isolated from the code that's running on the page that we're attacking. And if you were to view it, the inspect elements after it script ran, you can see we have all these new iframes injected, and those that get displayed uh, on the browser like this. And the iframes are running on a separate domain from the target we're attacking. Again, giving us further isolation by leveraging the single origin policy. And so, okay, cool. Now we've got our iframes up, and you've got some code running in there. Great. Okay, that's not too bad. Well, it's not quite the whole story. Um, and to highlight why it's not, imagine this scenario where you're intercepting a message, and what's the browser doing? It's waiting, right? It's in this weird state. It's just unloaded all the JavaScript on the page that is being exited and is waiting for this response to come back so it can load that in. Essentially, we're going to be in this dead man zone where the iframes that we have running, they're no longer running anymore. We have no JavaScript foothold uh, to respond back to. And so we needed something that would allow us to address this problem. And we used something called a service worker. 
So if you're not familiar with service workers, it's basically just a web worker, which is a background JavaScript thread, except that it's a little bit more special. So a web worker is lifecycle is dependent on the page that it was loaded in. It'll be created when the page is created, and it'll be destroyed when the page is destroyed. But a service worker actually has a long-lived lifespan. It's event-driven and has a few extra things it can do, like proxy messages in the browser. And we also leverage the service worker to do uh, to offload a bunch of the functionality so we could keep the UI elements as lightweight and responsive as possible. So these iframes really just deal with the visual interface of it. But all the code that's powering the heads-up display is being pulled into the service worker. And that code that's running in there and then it has to communicate back with these uh, iframes using the post message API. Not to be confused with an HTTP post message. This is um, an API in the browsers that allows for inter-window communication. But of course, we still have our inject page running on our the site, our target site, and so these iframes can then communicate with PBO post message to that because our service worker can't actually communicate with the target page because it's on a separate domain. And our inject page can then interact with the target application we're attacking to add those new interesting UI elements. But because we also don't want to, um, we're not going to rewrite Zap in JavaScript, we're going to leverage what we have already in Zap. And so we use the Zap API. And if you haven't looked at the Zap API, I would highly recommend it. You can drive the entire application from the simple REST interface. But because we also want these live, streamed, uh, live events being streamed back, we're also going to use a WebSocket connection to also access the API. And whenever these events get run through the bus and zap, they get sent to us. So every time there's a new message, every time there's a new alert discovered, it gets streamed right to the heads-up display, specifically to the service worker, which then communicates it back to all the different iframes. And finally, we keep the sort of persisted um, storage by using IndexedDB, which is an asynchronous storage in the browser. So intentionally, I've made this look really, really complicated, right? Like, it's, it's more than just as simple as it appears on top, but that's the goal, right? We wanted, we want to do the extra legwork to make this really simple, easy, beautiful interface, um, on top. And what I hope we've done is that when we come back to this question that you're asking your developers, hey, is this vulnerable to XSS? Hopefully, we've made it just a little bit easier. Hopefully, developers start using these tools to enable them to access security during their normal day. So now what? Uh, if you thought this was cool, please come help us make it even cooler. Uh, the barrier to entry is very low, let me tell you. I'm not a great developer. Uh, it's just built in JavaScript. If you have any sense of how to write beautiful JavaScript, please come in and help make our ugly code a lot more beautiful. Um, maybe you don't actually want to write code, but you want to support it. I mean, tell people about it. Um, let them know what's going on. But of course, the big question, right? When can we play with it? Well, we're hoping, fingers crossed, that this is actually going to get uh, released as an alpha on Monday. So after this, I'm going to go sit in a, in a hotel room and push PRs and finish our last large feature build so we can get it out to make sure it's good for everyone. And hopefully it'll be coming out Monday in the form of the weekly release of Zap, or you can just add it as an add-on in the add-on marketplace. Thank you very much. All right, David, thank you very much. You. Any, any questions? I can imagine there are some questions. All right, let's try this. Hi. Hey. So you explained a scenario in which it's uh, defenders who use the tool to figure out things before the attackers actually do. But if when it's a situation where one party uses SAP, but it's... Uh, on an, on another website that has no affiliation with it, you get an adversarial situation, don't you, between the site and the tool. So what dangers are there to the tool and the operator when it uh, analyzes a site that doesn't want to play nice? Yeah, that's definitely a question beyond my scope of, you know, how do we, how do we create security tools to help defend ourselves without making the problem worse? Um, I think a great example of this is, was it like six or eight months ago, some guy wrote some simple script to go through 
um, what's the site that enumerates all the exposed hardware in the world? Shodan. You wrote the script to go through Shodan real quick, automatically upon a bunch of like crappy databases, I forget which one, right? And release it to the public. Like to me, that's extremely irresponsible. Like he didn't really, he said it was for security, pur like testing purpose. Like no, it's not. Like you're just trying to grab a bunch of machines. But the flip side of that is like, what can we do to create responsible security tools? I mean, I don't really have like a great answer for it. I don't think, I don't I certainly don't think the heads up display makes that problem any better. We're just going to make easier access to the tools that already exist. And I also think that specifically with the Zap, the way it's created, the things you can do, it's really going to enable security more than it's going to hurt it in this case. I think this is going to help developers more than an attacker can use this to do something brutal. I mean, especially with Zap, a lot of it's going to be kind of like in mass scanning. So you should have some sort of like protection in front to stop like high volume of requests. So that's the best I can do on that one. I actually, I actually meant as a Zap operator, do I need to worry about getting hacked back by websites a lot? Oh, that's a great question. Before Zap was a, an independent process, a separate proxy. Now it's there in the browser. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Great question. That's something we've actually considered from the beginning. We've built in security and kept it in mind. Um, so a few of the things that we did to isolate it, right, running on a different domain. So single origin policy, that helps. Um, the problem that gets dangerous, right, was that the injected script. Now we have the bit running in there. Someone could use that to leverage it and get back. And so what we can do is with this post message API, that's the only way you can communicate from the target application back to the HUD. And what we can do with that is we can um, inject a little secret into the script that we put in there, and then we can use that, which won't be accessible by any other JavaScript running on there because it's enclosed by this closure, and then we can use that to verify that the message just came from our inject script. So that's we can verify that, and then now when our inject script is like, let's say, scraping something off this page and sending it back, we can also then put strong input validation right there because we know the only few points that's coming in. So I hope that assages your concerns a little bit. Awesome. Any other questions? Over to the, over there. Uh, hi, so this looks really awesome. Uh, turning on attack active scan is awesome. I'd love to see being able to do more targeted attacks, like select a search field and then say, just scan that. Yes. Yes, that is the other dream, right? Before we had the, the form highlighting to this XSS right here, the goal is then to have like a little icon next to that. It's got a crosshair on it, right? And you click on that, and it's like, what do you want to hit this with? And it says, XSS, and they're great. Here's a list of payloads. Hit it. And it just duh, 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 fires them off, and it's like, hey, we got it. Yes. Come help us build that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Okay, we got it. One more question down here. I don't have a question for you. It's a general statement for the previous question. We as always have a lot of uh, feedback from people saying, you're giving out information how to hack websites. We are building the ZEP tool. One hacker had an attack, and he described in his write-up that he was using ZEP. And a lot of people looked at OWASP like, hey, what are you doing? That's a big problem. If you recall some years ago in Germany, there was a law when you have tools that will reveal insecurity in software, you will be a potential uh, illegal. That's a general problem we have with OWASP, and we are focusing on fixing. Yes, our tools can be abused, and the same question on analogy we're using is like, you know, all know a paperclip. A paperclip can be used to lockpicking, so do we need to forbid a paperclip? That's a general question, and it's a political question. I think our tools are out there anyway. I think hackers have the tools already available, and the only thing we can do to share them, make them free available, and like those from uh, uh, David Death, make them accessible to developers to build them early. So that's a general problem we have with ours. We have been in the uh, radar for uh, lawmakers and uh, regulations, but that's the best we do. We try to keep it away from them and solve it on a foundation scope. Okay. Thank you, Rod. All right. So, so any more any more questions? We we still have some time, guys, for lunch. So, unless you're really hungry, I I have a question. Uh, so, how many head clients do you support if you run this on on a server uh, with uh, with API? Like how many browsers? Is it yeah? Is it one on one or is it? 
I mean, technically, we support all browsers, like any modern browser that supports these technologies. Uh, Testing-wise and uh, robustness and reliability-wise, as of now, uh, super good with Firefox. I believe it should work pretty good with Chrome. Um, I haven't tested Safari. should work great. Um, but yeah, anything that supports like pretty modern um, web standards should work on. Mm -hmm. And simultaneously? Or is it just one client? Oh, um, that's actually a good question. I don't, it should all work even if you have like multiple browsers open and you're proxying them all through Zap because it's all kind of contained in there? That's a good question. I'm not sure. Probably. And you can use like multiple like tabs and stuff like that. And you can like open open different things and do that. Oh, uh, yeah. So just to ask further on that then, which I think is what you're getting at, Sebra, is so, and especially as you showed a multiplayer game, if you can get multiple browsers being used by multiple testers or multiple developers, can they all look at the same website at the same time and feed into the same OWASP SAP database? Oh. Basically, can we all gang up against one application at once? That'd be and really cool. It as a group? <laughs> or, or have I just volunteered for something? <laughs> uh, we'll just make this a feature on Cloudflare. And then <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll go have a Cloudflare workers builder, right? Um, yeah, I don't know if someone else here might be able to tell me like whether Zap supports external database storage. And if you could do that, I guess you'd probably still write to the same one. Um, but yeah, that'd be really a neat way to uh, use the tool for sure. Hmm? Uh, we have a defect dojo tool where you can feed the different reports. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of cool things we can do with it. All right. Anything else? Yes. Um, we saw you open the browsers from the Zap application itself. Can this HUD also work if you open your browser through other means? Yeah. The first browser I had actually opened was just normal Firefox. So um, browser launch is a really easy way to do it, but it'll work even if you're not using the browser launch. And is there a way to set it up then, or does it just work? Yeah, you just, you oh, yeah. There's a, it's just an add-on, and in the normal... Uh, I shouldn't close that. Oh, well. Uh, when you open up the normal Zap screen, there's just a little <laughs> HUD icon at the top. So you just click it to turn it on, and you click it to turn it off. That's very accessible. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? To extend the question, the previous question, so when you click the button in the Zap interface, it auto-detects the browser, or how does it work exactly? Um, how does it know where to like, inject it? Into yes, it? yes. It'll do it on the next request, so it's on the proxing of it. So when the response comes back, it'll automatically inject the script into the HTML, like it's fed back to the browser, and then it'll get exposed that way. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs>